Any questions thus far? Or just observations? Insights that you have that you'd like to add to illuminate us about what we've just covered. Kind of brutal. Yeah? Yeah. The whole beheading really of the kings, that's pretty crazy. What's that? They, well, they're like they, the kings are hit up in the, in the cave and then he beheads them all. Mm -hmm. Just kind of brutal. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I think, you know, it, we oftentimes diminish or diminuate the, how seriously God takes holiness, you know. And uh, thankfully for the gospel, uh, but by God's grace, there go we, you know. And, and the judgment, you know, and, and the coming judgment will be brutal too, be horrific. Uh, for those who are not part of God's new covenant. Um, I think that should spur us all the more to <coughs> seek to bring the message of blessing to others. Okay. Um, I've got a couple of boys, uh, six and next month, want to be five but we go through each night we read a bible story okay and uh, this book that we're using is is really quite detailed um, quite excellent <laughs> and right now we we've just completed the period of the judges of the of joshua and uh, going into the judges <laughs> those guys are enraptured in you know uh, but, you know, all of this killing and warfare and stuff like that is... It's an action story. It's an action story, yeah. Yeah. We don't even let them watch Star Wars yet. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, and they're getting nice. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, I should say my wife doesn't let them watch Star Wars yet. Um, I would probably be inclined to do so but uh, but here we're reading these stories at bedtime just before they're supposed to go to sleep <laughs> so yeah we haven't had that yet yeah so okay well let's press on here uh, with the remainder of the book of uh, Joshua um, central in all of this is the Ark of the Covenant uh, the ark leads them into battle, uh, and the point here is that God is the commander. This is his throne. He leads them forth. But uh, once the warfare has ceased, although all the land hasn't been technically conquered yet, um, the ark of the covenant then is located at Shiloh. And uh, for the period now that remains in Joshua and uh, for the early part of the period of the described in, in the book of Judges, it will be in Shiloh. Uh, that's where the tabernacle will reside. Uh, you know, that's where it's put up. Uh, that's where the priests will do their uh, uh, work of mediation. Uh, Eli, if you remember Eli, who will come in 1 Samuel. Um, no, I'm sorry, Eli, that's, that's uh, uh, later on. So Eli wouldn't be there at Shiloh. Um, but it'll become important, the reference to Shiloh later on when we're talking about the prophets, because during the time of Israel's apostasy, during the, the judges, um, the Philistines will in fact take control of the ark and will destroy Shiloh. And the prophets will pick this up then in the prophetic period saying just because you've got the temple and the Ark of the Covenant here doesn't mean that the enemy can't come and destroy you if God has in fact um, um, deserted you because of your faithlessness. Okay, uh, most of the latter half of the book of Joshua then is a description of the distribution of the land. So now they're settled. Uh, 
now it's the parceling out, what they call the allotting, the allotments of the land to the various tribes, chapters 13 through 21. Okay, And uh, these are some of the highlights that we see in this uh, section of Joshua. Some of the land is still to be conquered. They haven't gotten rid of all the Canaanites. Uh, there still is some land to be conquered. It's still unfinished business. Uh, the Transjordan, that land east uh, of the Jordan, is then to be given to the tribes of Reub, Reuben, Gad, and then what's called the half-tribe of Manasseh. So you remember that Joseph himself was not allotted a tribe, uh, but his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, were made tribes, and so they're called half-tribes. Uh, that land east of the Jordan had already been given to them by Moses. So um, this territory here is given to the, uh, uh, these tribes, Gad, Reuben, Manasseh. Uh, by the way, the agreement that was made uh, when, when the people of these tribes said, hey, we'd like to settle here. We'd like this land. Can we settle on this side of the river? Um, Moses said, yeah, but you have to help fight and conquer the rest of the land, the true uh, land of Canaan here. And in fact, then these tribes would typically lead the way in the battles uh, just to show that they would help conquer the rest of the land. Okay, the southern territory uh, will be for Judah. Okay, uh, the southern territory will be given to Judah, uh, the tribe of Judah first. So although the other territory on the Transjordan has already been allotted, the one who gets first dibs among the remaining tribes is Judah. And the reason for this is because Caleb is from the tribe of Judah. And Caleb had been faithful, you remember, back in the spying out of the land. He said, we can trust the Lord. And so this is kind of the reward to him, but it's a corporate reward to his whole tribe. And in fact, Caleb gets a whole city, Hebron, in that territory. Okay? So um, uh, this is the, the region of Judah then that is given, the southern territory. Uh, Simeon is kind of also allotted territory here, but they become assimilated especially uh, so that there's virtually no distinction between the two, and this all then becomes understood as just Judah. Okay, the second choice is given to Joseph, his descendants from his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, those uh, half-tribes. So allotments given to them, and I'm not quite sure why uh, second choice is given to them. Maybe if any of you know, I can give you extra credit <laughs> for the course. Do research on that. So um, what you have them is Ephraim here and Manasseh. Uh, Manasseh gets territory both on the east side of the Jordan then, and also on the west side. And so Manasseh gets some significant territory. Okay. And um, by the way, even before this allotment takes place, uh, the tribes themselves go out as 12 tribes and divide up the territory in terms of saying it, they divide up the whole into 12 pieces. Okay. They don't decide who gets which piece but they corporately decide what are the pieces. Okay. And you might wonder, well, why such a big piece here for Judah? This is, a lot of this is desert. This is Negev, um, very kind of poor agricultural territory here. Uh, this is why Judah was never very prosperous agriculturally, even in the divided kingdom later on. Okay. 
The uh, allotments for the other seven tribes are determined by lots, by a casting of lots. Uh, the Levites then are assigned cities, designated cities throughout this territory. Uh, remember, the Levites are distributed throughout the whole territory so that they might minister to the all 12 tribes, or I should say all uh, 10 tribes and the two half tribes. Uh, but they are also given some property in these specific cities. Okay? Then I think it's important for us to discuss the theological significance of the land here for Christians because, again, this is a place where there's a lot of confusion. Um, um, there are many evangelicals today who say that we have to support Israel and its right to that land because Abraham was promised that land and his descendants were promised that land uh, by Moses himself. Okay? Um, the New Testament, we have to theologically interpret this through the lens of the New Testament and uh, Christologically and Christocentrically in terms of the fulfillment in Christ and uh, simply what the Holy Spirit tells us in the New Testament uh, about this fulfillment. Okay? In uh, Romans chapter 14, verses 12 and, uh, cha I'm sorry, Romans chapter 4, verses 12 and 13, Paul himself said that Abraham was looking forward to inheriting the world. Okay? So it's not just this little parcel of land, uh, sandy beach and rocky terrain uh, on the Mediterranean, that God was ultimately promising Abraham an inheritance of the world, Abraham and his descendants. And so the New Testament is looking beyond simply Canaan to a greater reality of what God is, is working through here. Uh, it was either yesterday or the day before that we looked at the passage from Hebrews chapter 11, verses 8 to 10 and 13 to 16, where we're told that Abraham uh, never really possessed the land, but he was looking for the city whose builder and architect uh, is God. So he's looking here forward to something more significant than these you know, geographical places uh, in Palestine to the new, new Jerusalem and the new heaven and the new earth. Okay. Um, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 3, and uh, verses 8 to 11, if you want to turn to that, the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 4. where it's speaking of the rest that God provides, which um, relates specifically here to the conquest where the people were now to rest in the land. Okay. Um, chapter 4, verse 1 says, Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still remains, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. So it's kind of the same warning that we heard in Deuteronomy. But for, for this more um, uh, significant land and possession of the new heaven and the new earth. For good news came to us just as it did to them. But the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. So it's talking about, uh, again, the, the land of, of the old uh, they lost it because they disobeyed the covenant. For we who have believed, faith here, enter that rest, and again the issue here is the rest in the land, as he has said, as I swore in my wrath, 
they shall not enter my rest. rest. Uh, the judgment for disobeying, breaking the covenant. Um, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. And then if you want to skip over to verse 8. Reference to Joshua here. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So he's saying there's something more than just the, the rest in the land that took place in Joshua's conquest. There's something further, a deeper fulfillment. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from, from his. So it's really speaking here of the kingdom of God, which is achieved by faith, justification by faith alone, and simply resting in the work of God and his kingdom, which is brought to us through Jesus Christ. Uh, Christ's announcement when he appeared that the, the kingdom of God is upon you. Uh, his rule of grace here. That's what we rest in, not some physical parcel of land, but we rest in the kingdom of God, um, uh, which is in Jesus Christ. So uh, that will find its, its ultimate um, fulfillment in the new heaven and the new earth. And uh, that's wh where we wait for the real thing as described in 2 Peter chapter 3 and Revelation chapters 21 and 22. Okay. So the covenant really now speaks of a land purchased with the blood of Christ uh, where we will receive what Adam lost, okay, the, the perfect creation and more than that. But this territory on the Mediterranean is again just a beachhead through which God will work his plan, his purposes to reclaim all of creation. That's really the land that we look forward to, whose founder and um, uh, creator is God. Okay? So um, that's kind of the theological significance here. Uh, then towards the end of Joshua, um, you have <coughs> a, a return to um, uh, the worship of God um, uh, and there's a renewal of the covenant uh, altar is set up and, and sacrifices made and then also a um, establishment uh, of the ongoing uh, attention to the covenant uh, what's called a covenant re renew renewal ceremony at Shechem where the people renew their, their vows to the covenant. And it's at this point that the, the familiar verse, verse 15, where Jesus says, choose today whom you will serve. Joseph, just, uh, Joshua says this, choose today who you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Okay. So that renewal of the covenant uh, in Joshua chapters 22, and the death of Joshua. And uh, Joseph's body is also brought and buried at Shechem uh, in chapter 24. So his sarcophagus, his mummy is brought from Egypt so that he can also now reside in the promised land, even Joseph. Uh, so Joshua dies at the end of the book of Joshua. So you think of this. Um, the end of Deuteronomy is where Moses dies. The end of the book of Joshua is where Joshua dies. And that sets up then the transition to the book of, Num of Judges. Um, I found out why uh, Manasseh and Ephraim got their land second. Great. Um, <laughs> there goes your extra um, It's in Genesis 48. Um, verse 22 where uh, Israel is talking to Joseph and he says and to you as one who is over your brothers I give the ridge of land I took from the Amorites with my sword and my bow oh so it, 
he had already promised a yeah. land that he took to okay. Joseph and his sons. Okay, okay. So um, they kept to that promise. Joshua did that, you know, here 400, 500 years later. Good. Thank you for that sleuth work. I'll make a net mental note of that, uh, Hugh, here to give you extra credit. <laughs> Okay, now let's move on to the book of Judges. Book of Judges. And essentially what you see in the book of Judges is the account of these foreign countries, enemies, invading and taking control of the land. Typically, it's not that they control the whole. It, this is what you have here, even with the 12 tribes, is what we call a tribal confederacy, um, similar to the Greek amphictyony, where you've got a confederation of tribes working together, uh, aligned with one another. Uh, so typically, in the period of the, the, the judges, you will have tribes that are falling away, uh, or number of tribes in the same region. So God brings these foreign oppressors to oppress certain territories, certain uh, tribes. But it's not at one time the whole region here being occupied by the enemy. It's more piecemeal. Okay? Now, it's important to understand uh, the setting here behind the book of Judges. Um, and it has to do with their settling now and uh, uh, being permanently residents uh, in the territory. In Egypt, they had been slaves, really didn't own territory, didn't own property. Uh, they did farming and building and so forth for the masters. But even the farming was such that it was all irrigated. Egypt is desert, so all the farming is done by irrigation from the Nile. Uh, so there's not the same kind of dependence upon uh, the, the rain and the precipitation and so forth. Now when you get into Palestine, things have changed. They, they have to take up farming. Uh, they've been nomads for 40 years. So this generation was born in the desert. So they don't know anything about farming. And uh, so they have to start growing their own crops. The manna has ceased. Okay? Um, because there are still, they've allowed Canaanites and Amorites and so forth to reside in the land with them, um, they seek the advice of these Canaanites. Okay? Well, you know how to farm. You've done this for a while. Tell us the secrets. Tell us the rules. And this is where theology comes in. That the theology of the Canaanites is integrally related to their agricultural practices. And so the Canaanite neighbor says, well, you've got to do it this way, or you're not going to get crops. You're not going to get rain. And so the Israelites buy into what the Canaanites say. Okay, um, the problem uh, that I've just implied here is described in opening chapter of Judges that they haven't gotten rid of the infection. Okay, there's still Canaanites who are practicing their idolatrous religion uh, in the midst of the Israelites, and uh, this is a statement that makes that very cl clear from chapter 1, verse 27 and following. But Manasseh did not drive out the people of Bethshan or Tanakh or Dor of Iblam or Megiddo and their surrounding set settlements, for the Canaanites were determined to live in that land. When Israel became strong, they pressed the Canaanites into forced labor, okay, but never drove them out completely. So, well, we can use them. They'll become our slaves. Okay? 
uh, uh, what should have been devoted to the Lord, now they're devoting it to themselves. We'll just use them as forced labor. But they're still living with them and being influenced by them. Nor did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites living in Gezer. But the Canaanites continued to live there among them. Neither did Zebulun drive out the Canaanites and on and on and on. Uh, same story over and over again. Okay, what's the result here, which continues then to be the problem? Chapter 2. And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers. So one generation, the generation of the conquest now, is passed on, has died. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. Okay, so now we'll hear about the Baals. I, I understand that the, the more technical pr pronunciation, probably more accurate, is Baal. Okay, but uh, the more common use pronunciation is Baal, and that's even what the dictionary has as the pronunciation. So for our purposes, we'll use the Baals. And they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went after other gods from among the gods of the peoples who were around them and bowed down to them. And they provoked the Lord to anger because they forsook him and served Baal and the Ashtoreths. The Ashtoreths are the female deities. The Baals are the male deities here. So what we'll see now, a progression through the book of Judges. And uh, the acronym here is AAL, <laughs> formerly Thrivent, okay? Or, or what formerly now is, is Thrivent, uh, AAL. Um, the early chapters of the book of Judges depict the Israelites amongst the Canaanites. They haven't displaced the Canaanites. They haven't dispossessed the Canaanites. The Canaanites are there amongst them and they are amongst the Canaanites. The second phase is against the Canaanites. The Canaanites rise up against them and Canaanites from beyond the territory invade and so you have the conflict with the Canaanites and thus the, the, the need for deliverers for the judges. But by the end we find them like the Canaanites. The latter chapters of the book of Judges depict the Israelites living like the Canaanites. <laughs> and uh, it's a sorry state of affairs, to say the least, in those latter chapters. So that's the progression here. Now, what's behind the theology of the Canaanites? This graphic, again, from Crossways demonstrates it. You have it in your book as well that explains it. Okay, um, the Canaanites believed that the deities were gods and goddesses, male and female, and the, uh, the uh, deities that are most significant for our purposes as uh, related here in the book of Judges is the male deity Baal and the female deities, the Ashtaroth. Uh, again, Baal kind of had his harem of deities. And uh, the Canaanites then had their graven images of these. You've got the male and the female here, uh, which were kind of uh, then uh, token images of the, 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 the uh, invisible deities. Um, and and, and these, these idols then communicated the presence of those deities as well. And they believed that the deities were, were present and could be c contacted through these images. Okay? So uh, oftentimes uh, the kind of sexual um, organs were particularly accented in these images. Uh, terracotta, some made out of stone, some of wood, and, and some precious metal and so forth. Okay, so you've got uh, the deities represented by these models, these idols. Okay, uh, when it comes now to agriculture, um, 
They believe that uh, the agriculture is completely dependent upon, and thus the X here, the rain from above. The, 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 the rain that comes from above, the, this is dry, arid territory, so rain is, precipitation is highly valued, and they need it. You can't irrigate like uh, they did in Egypt. Um, and the idea of covenant having anything to do with this um, there, there's no covenant relationship to the prosperity of the land and the productivity of the land. As God would state in, um, in, in the covenant of Sinai and so forth. So uh, what you have then here is the idea that human beings down here on earth can influence the behavior of the deities. And Baal was the storm god, so the god of rain and precipitation. And the Ashtoreth were considered kind of the fertility goddesses of the soil. And so they believed that when it rained, the male Baal deity was having intercourse with the female Ashtoreth deity. Okay? And... Uh, that the rain was actually insemination of the, the ground, okay? That that's what's happening here. Um, and if you wanted it to rain, the way that you would make it rain was to, in a sense, <laughs> stimulate the gods to uh, engage in sexual activity. Okay, good question. You did that ritually by going into the shrines of these gods and goddesses where these idols were. And remember, these are the connecting places. This is where you can communicate with the god or the goddess in these tents, in these shrines, and so forth. Uh, uh, in these buildings, these temples, you would go there. And you would have sexual intercourse. And that would then stimulate the gods to do their thing, too, and for Baal to inseminate the ground with, um, with rain. Okay. So with the Canaanite religion, um, sexual activity is part and parcel with your practice of religion and even your worship. You would go into the shrines and the temples and there was ritual prostitution. Okay? Uh, and this isn't just limited to the Canaanites. This is fairly widespread throughout the Middle East, even in, in Greece and uh, so forth. Some of the Indo-European societies. Same basic concept uh, exists there. And, uh, and so this is what you would do. You would, uh, any kind of uh, sexual uh, behavior uh, would stimulate the gods and the goddesses to engage in the same, which would bring rain and fertility. Okay. And, uh, and all kinds of sexual behavior, uh, all kinds of sexual licentiousness and perversions were part of this, okay? So it's, it's, for the Canaanites, considered a very good thing uh, to engage in all kinds of perversions uh, because that's what causes the crops to grow. That's what brings the rain, precipitation. And was this, a, was this a more truly thought, widespread idea, or was this more like, we're just gonna go take care of our humanly needs and blame it on rain? Or is it rather like they truly went and were like, we need to get and did it in a religious fashion? Well, they truly believed that this, this was bringing the rain, but it wasn't like, oh, I'm sorry, I have to go and, you know, worship in this way. Oh, what a drag, you know. No, they're, they're you know, they're having pleasure yeah. in the process too. But it's showing the deception of Satan, of, of the, the beautiful gift of, sexual intimacy for marriage that God had ordained, uh, how he has perverted it in their, their minds, 
and associated it with the very fabric of their society, which is an agricultural society. Okay. And again, you, you find ritual prostitution all over the place. Okay. Even in the New Testament, okay, you think of, of St. Paul going into Greece in Corinth, okay, the Acropolis of Corinth. Uh, that's, they, they housed all kinds of uh, ritual prostitutes, temple prostitutes. So, um, so this is the kind of setting, and the Israelites are influenced by this, you know. We're not having very good luck with our farming. You know, and the Canaanites, they seem to know what works, and they insist this is key. This is fundamental to successful agriculture. So, well, they seem to know, and besides, uh, I can have some p pleasure that Yahweh doesn't, you know, let me have. <laughs> so they indulge their sinful desires, certainly, here, too. So this is the background, um, and, and so the, the actions of the human beings, of their sexual activity, sexual perversions, then uh, act to stimulate and to elicit uh, the gods to provide fertility to the land. Okay? This is still very typical of, of pagan theology today, the idea that we can somehow manipulate, motivate, um, you know, entice the gods to do what we want. And it still is very much a part of what Luther called the theology of glory that uh, can be found even, uh, I mean, the same general concept, maybe not with the same kind of sexual perversions and so forth, but the same idea that, you know, God will serve my bidding. You know, if I do certain things, uh, he will do what I want him to do. Uh, that God is kind of like a um, one-armed bandit that I, you know, if I do this, then he's going to provide me with the blessings because that's the way it goes. Uh, some of the TV evangelists, you know, if you send in this money, then God will bless you. Send in this uh, uh, donation. It's essentially paganism. But the covenant has nothing to do with it. <clears throat> the covenant is left out because it, it's incompatible with that theology. Okay, so now the punishment arises that's described in Genesis, Judges chapter 2 really just gives you the outline for the whole book here. They provoked the Lord to anger because they forsook him and served Baal and the Asherahs. In his anger against Israel, the Lord handed them over to raiders who plundered them. So now there's the reverse holy war, that God is using the outsiders to wage holy war against his people because they have become like the Canaanites. He sold them to their enemies all around, whom they were no longer able to resist. Whenever Israel went out to fight, the hand of the Lord was against them to defeat them, just as he had sworn to them. They were in great distress. So now God wages holy war against the Israelites. And uh, if need be, the land will vomit them out because of their iniquity. But when they do cry, when they repent, when they call out in repentance, the Lord answers. And the provision then is this. Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hands of these raiders. Whenever the Lord raised up a judge for them, he was with the judge and saved them out of the hands of their enemies as long as the judge lived. For the Lord had compassion on them as they groaned under those who oppressed and afflicted them. So the provision is these judges who are like deliverers, who deliver them and then... Um, preside over them and uh, govern them. So the judge is really a kind of deliverer. It's not just like we think of the judge purely judicial in his function, but there are, it's mixed together here. 
uh, religious, military, political, and judicial. But the term that they use here is judge. Um, so, Timaeus, uh, in your classical studies, I don't know if you ever studied um, Hannibal, okay? Uh, Hannibal and his invasion of, of uh, yeah, yeah, of Italy and the uh, conflict. Hannibal was a, a Carthaginian, Carthage, in North Africa, and Carthage had actually been settled by the Phoenicians. Okay, the Phoenicians are Canaanites. Okay, uh, the Phoenicians uh, along the coast, and uh, and and so they they were Semites. They were Semitic, and the uh, Carthaginians spoke Semitic language. Hannibal, one of their leaders, was was Semitic and spoke a Semitic language. But the leaders of the, you, you see this in, um, in the, the Latin writings even, uh, that the, the Carthaginians here, their leaders, including Hannibal is, is called uh, Sufetes. Sufetes, okay. And um, this, is related um, etymologically to the Hebrew word, Semitic word, shofate, okay, which is judge. This is the word that's used in, in, in uh, the Old Testament as judge. So, so this is, uh, the, the point I'm making is that Hannibal was not just a judicial figure. He was a conqueror. He was a general. <laughs> uh, he was there to deliver his people. And uh, he was addressed as a judge, given a similar title to this. Now, in the book of Judges, then, we also see a continuing cycle, especially through chapters 1 through 16 um, of the Judges. And it's another acronym here, mnemonic device, that you can remember it. A, B, C, D. A is for apostasy, the people's sin. B is for battering, the Lord disciplines his people, batters them with a oppressive invading people or uprising from the Canaanites within them. C, cry, the people cry to the Lord for help. Uh, they finally get the message and repent. And D, deliverance. The Lord raises up a judge to rescue his people from their oppressors. So this is a cycle that you see time and time again through the book of Judges. And that cycle is, is pretty much spelled out very clearly in chapter 2. It's just kind of like this is the outline for the book. So you get a preview of, of these cycles going over and over again. Um, with the apostasy, the battering, the cry, and the deliverance. Okay. Um, the, again, the cycle is, is summarized here, previewed in Judges 2, 10 through 23. And it covers a time span, the period of the Judges here covers a time span of between 200 and 400 years, from uh, two to four centuries. The reason why we can't be precise here is because uh, the judges overlap with one another. So they're not perfectly um, chron chronology. There's not a perfect chronology of just one after the other. There's overlap. And so it's difficult to know what that overlap is precisely. OK, so we begin then with uh, the, the tribes living in their allotted territories. Now farming, doing agriculture, and, and being influenced by the Canaanite presence and infected by them. Um, these are the judges. There are seven judges described. And uh, uh, each of them is raised up in response to an attacking force, attacking neighbor. The uh, first attack comes from the Moabites from the south. And as you can see here, they come up and uh, attack Ephraim. 
the delivering judge is Ehud. A very, very interesting story of how he delivers um, his people. We don't have time to go in that. I'll just highlight the, the important judges for the purpose of the exam. A question about the Moabites. When they were still with Moses, uh, God commanded them not to attack the Moabites or the Amorites at that time. But is God just using the Moabites to get them back on track at this point? Or, I mean, because you have them, no, leave them alone because those are the, the sons of you know, from the family of Lot, and, mm -hmm. you know, he's part of the descendants of Abraham, you know, that family line. So, you right. know, I guess it's, why didn't they take him out then as well? Yeah, I think the prime reason was because the Moabite territory was not considered to be part of the promised land, okay? okay. So they're not going to just take out whoever, but it's got to be the, the promised land. Eve, the promised land is essentially this territory here. Even this is conquered, um, but it, it is kind of an appendage. Okay. okay. So, um, uh, and and part of the reason it's conquered is because the kings resist them. They come down actually to fight against them, and so the they they um, respond by conquering them. Uh, that wasn't the case of the Moabites, but there's no question. I mean, God is probably also reserving. He, he has these other nations in store to, to use holy war against his people as the need might arise. Good, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, the second incident here is Canaanites. And this is kind of a, an uprising. Uh, there's still a, a significant Canaanite presence, presence here in this territory of Naphtali, up in the north. And uh, they come down and uh, try to assert more of the territory here in Issachar. And uh, Deborah is the one who is the judge, in this case a female. So we have a female uh, deliverer that God uses. Um, she uh, summons the um, support of a general by the name of, of Barak. Okay. And um, uh, because she's afraid that the, the men will simply wouldn't follow the leadership of a woman, um, she says, if I go, people will say that a woman, woman won this. And so uh, Barak essentially leads the, the, the charge, but uh, it's really Deborah who is the instigator of this all. And uh, they win against uh, the Canaanites. Um, the, the general of the Canaanites, whose name is Sisera, S-I-S-E-R-A, uh, flees. And he flees to a tent, uh, or a house, I'm sorry and uh, asks for refuge there, asks to be hidden away. And uh, the woman resident there says, yeah, I'll, I'll hide you away. I'll, I'll watch the door for you. And uh, so while uh, she's doing that, he thinks he's safe and, and he's exhausted from the, the battle and his, his retreat and flight. And so he falls asleep. And when he's asleep, this woman kills him by driving a pen uh, tent peg through his temple. Okay, so again, it's pretty gory here. What is her name? I didn't write that down. Um, I'm sure it's given. Uh, this is in chapters four and five. Uh, somewhere it's probably given. Um, but yeah, okay, J L, J A E L, and uh, uh, so the general is is killed by a woman. And so it shows that God's using women as well to accomplish his purposes of deliverance, Deborah and this Jael. Uh, chapter 5, then you have the Song of Deborah and Barak, which is just a masterpiece of uh, literature uh, for you to enjoy at your leisure. Okay, 
So uh, Deborah is important. The next one is also important here for the purposes of the exam. Gideon. And here you have the Midianites and the Amalekites coming in okay, from the Sinai Peninsula um, and, and actually Arabia, more Arabia. Um, do you remember who was the ancestor of the Midianites? Abraham. Abraham's son through which wife? Keturah, right? right. How about the Amalekites? That, well... There was an Amalek that they fought, wasn't there? They've already fought the Amalekites. You remember, even before they got to Sinai, they fought the Amalekites. Yeah, he's a descendant. I, I don't think he's, he might be the grandson of Esau, I think, grandson of Esau. So these are Semites, again, Semitic people, but God is using them here to... Um, attack the the chosen people. What's that? Where did they attack? Yeah. Okay, they attack over here. It looks like more of the central region as well. Uh, Issachar, uh, maybe northern part of Manasseh, just kind of southwest of the Sea of Galilee. Okay. So, um, the people cry out then under the oppression here of the Midianites and the Amalekites, and God raises up a judge, a deliverer, by the name of Gideon. And Gideon is reluctant. He says, I'm of you know, the most insignificant family of the most insignificant clan. Why are you calling me? God said, that's the point. <laughs> I'm using the weak. Um, I'm using those who are insignificant. Oftentimes he does that. Just look at the apostles, the disciples and such he uses. He uses people like me and you as well. Um, and the point here is that God will win the battle. Okay, so Gideon is reluctant, and there's some story behind that as well. God finally persuades him uh, to take up the role of being a deliverer. And so Gideon summons the people of Israel, to come and fight. And uh, 32,000 men answer the call and uh, present themselves for battle. Uh, but God says, no, the battle is mine. I don't need this many. So let the ones who are kind of afraid, you know, who are a bit reluctant, let them go home. Okay? We'll just take the, the really brave ones. The, the ones who are willing. And so that announcement is made, and uh, the ones that are left are 10,000. Okay, ready to go, 10,000. God says, nope, I don't need that many. Remember, the battle is the Lord's. It's not by your strength, not by your might, but by the, work, the strength of the Lord here. So we need to pare these troops down. Um, have them go down by the river and drink. And uh, uh, the ones who drink in a certain way, and I can't always keep it straight. Ones on their knees with their sword still in their hand stayed, the ones that... Yeah, okay, okay. The ones who, who, who uh, held on to the, the sword, you know, held on to their weapon while they drank, they're the ones who get to stay. Uh, but the other ones... Uh, they're dismissed. And that leaves only 300 men, okay, 300, against the Midianite and uh, Amalekite forces of thousands, okay? So uh, what God simply says here is follow my directions. Uh, in the night, those 300 men are to surround the camp of the Midianites and the Malachites, it's especially Midianites, and that helps to remember Gideon was with the Midianite against the Midianites. Okay, and um, uh, they were only to take with them a sword, a torch, and a I'm, I'm sorry, not even a sword, a um, uh, a trumpet, a torch, 
and a pot. Okay? And the torch would be lit, but the pot would cover it so they couldn't see the flame. They would have the, the trumpet, okay? And they were all surrounded. And at the given signal at night, while the camp was sleeping, uh, Gideon would blow the trumpet. The others would blow their trumpets. They would break the, the, the jar so that the torch could be seen. And the uh, enemy troops woke to this. They went out of their tents. And they saw surrounding them these flames. They heard these trumpet blasts, which are usually associated with a, uh, an attack, an invasion. And they heard maybe some of the clash and clatter of the, the breaking of the jugs and the jars. And they panic. And they go every which way. They disperse. They trample one another. They, they think that those they run into are the enemy, and they, they actually fight and, and kill one another. And the men of Israel haven't even raised a sword. And God defeats the enemy. They run with their tails behind their, uh, between their legs, the ones that survive. So the battle is the Lord's. And uh, here's a depiction of that. Uh, it's not by the might and the military strength of the people at all. So Gideon's another important personage here. Um, then you have the Ammonites coming in from this territory of, of Jordan, uh, attacking the tribe of Gad. Jephthah is the one who is sent to deliver them. Uh, he's a great warrior, but he's a foolish man. He thinks that he has to bargain with God, that he has to make a deal with God. Got some of that pagan thinking in his mind. And so before the battle, he makes an, takes an oath. God, if you will ha enable me to win this battle, when I return back home, uh, whichever person I meet first, I will sacrifice to you. And so he wins the battle, and he comes back home. And uh, the first person who he meets comes running out to him as his daughter. And so he sacrifices her. He feels he has to keep that pledge. Um, so again, even these, these uh, people that God uses themselves are not all that pure and righteous, and they don't have it all straight themselves, yet God can use them. He still has a lot of pagan thinking. Uh, so God prohibited the sacrifice of your children in his law. I mean, that's what the Moabites do. That's what the Canaanites did. Um, and uh, yet this is what happens here. Okay, probably the, the most memorable narrative from the judges has to do with Samson. And the thing that you can need to remember is that Samson deals with the Philistines. The Philistines, okay? The Philistines are actually kind of Johnny's come lately to this territory. Um, uh, they arrived um, probably ar ar around the 1300s, 1200s, and they came from the north, actually from the Aegean. Um, they're part of the massive invasions that came from the north and from the sea. Uh, they're called the Sea Peoples. Um, and uh, we read about them in the uh, Egyptian literature as well. Uh, Egypt used okay, these consonants. Uh, but you see the, the Philistine um, uh, concept there. Uh, also, then, we get the word Palestine. From this, okay. So the term Palestine actually comes from Philistine um, here. But uh, Samson now is the one who addresses the the Philistines. And um, you know the story of Samson. Uh, he's this macho he-man. Um, he's typically depicted as 
even more muscular than, than that here in this woodcut uh, you see. But his strength wasn't really in necessarily his, you know, whatever his bench press from with lifting weights or whatever, his bicep diameter or whatever, uh, but it came from the Lord. It was a supernatural strength. He is also a Nazarite, um, was devoted uh, to God in a special way according to the Nazarite vow. And the Nazarites were those who were to wear their hair long and they were to keep from uncleanness, uh, which included touching anything that was dead. Okay. They were also to abstain from any kind of alcohol. Okay. Uh, it's some have speculated that John the Baptist um, uh, had taken or was devoted to the Nazarite vow. We don't know that for sure, but it's, it's probable that uh, Samson was here uh, in terms of that. Uh, in one case, he goes down to a Philistine city and, and lifts the city doors from the gates and carries them off and carries them up to the mountain just to show uh, how strong and manly he is. In another instance, he uh, wrestles with a lion and kills a lion with his bare hands. Okay? The problem with Samson, though, is he was a he-man with a she problem. Okay? And uh, he was always a attracted to Philistine women. He had this thing for Philistine women. And um, he actually married a Philistine woman. Um, uh, this is even before Delilah. Okay. Um, and uh, when the Philistines come to take her back and refuse for him to be with her and visit her and actually kill her, then he retaliates. One of the things that he does is he ties um, uh, torches to the tails of a bunch of foxes and sets them loose in the Philistine grain fields and it burns up all their grain. But in direct retaliation to the killing of, their, of his Philistine wife, um, he, he's holed up in, in a cave and there's 3,000 Philistine men who come to get him. And he says, I'll go peacefully if you promise just not to, to kill me. But, but they say, well, we need to bind you. So they, they tie him up and they take him out. Uh, and then when he gets close to the city, he just kind of bursts the ropes as if they had been little threads. And he grabs the nearest weapon that he can, which is a jawbone of a donkey, as you can see here, and wields that and uh, slays uh, a myriad of, of men. Did he tear it off the donkey? No, the donkey, the, the donkey was already dead. No. He just saw the skeleton or the jaw Okay, down well, that's there. not that weird <laughs> because <laughs> earlier he kills the lion and then he comes back days later and there's bees and honey and he scrapes it out and he starts eating it and then he gives it to his parents but he doesn't tell them what they're eating. Right, right. It's and then the strange. riddle. There's a lot. I mean, it's, it's, there's, it's entertaining reading too. Uh, I'm sure we haven't got to it yet with my sons, but I'm sure they'll really get into the Samson stories here. But the, the point is here, uh, I mean, he kills the lion, but then he goes back to the carcass and touches it. The Nazarite was not to touch anything unclean like this. So he's not really taking his Nazarite vows very seriously at all. And another thing is, he is the biggest party animal. Uh, he loves to go down to the Philistines. The Philistines were big beer chug chuggers. Okay, um, uh, we, we have, uh, when I did some study at the University of Chicago, I had a class in the Oriental Institute where we were looking at all this, you know, all this pottery and stuff. And the, the uh, Philistine pottery is very, very recognizable, right? recognizable. And it's very similar to the Mycenaean pottery of uh, Greece, because uh, that's where they came from. And, uh, um, but uh, the most common piece of pottery are beer, beer mugs, <laughs> okay? because they would have chug -lug contests all the time. That's how they would you know, show their manliness. And, and you read that in the narrative, too. I mean, it's, it's 
going on beer and wine and so forth. So that's another way he, he's, he's not keeping the Nazarite vow, but God still uses him, okay? But his she problem is the undoing of him ultimately in Delilah. And Delilah is a plant by the Philistines. Uh, they know his vulnerability with women. And so she is planted as a mole, as a spy here, to discover the source of his strength. And uh, she keeps pressing him, and he'll kind of uh, give her a wrong answer. And then, lo and behold, uh, someone will try to undo what that wrong answer is. You'd think he would have figured out this woman is, isn't to be trusted. But eventually, because she nags him so much, he tells her the true source of his strength is through the Lord, through Yahweh, uh, given to him because of his long hair. Okay. Well, next time they're asleep, or he's asleep, then um, uh, his hair is cut off. And uh, the listings, I believe Delilah actually cuts off the hair. And the listings are... Uh, hiding in the cl closet and so forth, ready to jump out once the hair is cut off, and they can bind him then. They um, uh, ambush him and bind him, and his strength is gone because the hair is gone. Okay, so then he's put on display. I mean, he's, he's the major attraction. Uh, there's a big party that's feast and festival. That's because this this one who had been um, our um, main troublemaker is finally now restrained. And he prays to the Lord that the Lord would re 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 return his strength. Uh, and uh, he's, he's put on display with ropes and chains and so forth. And uh, the Lord does grant him strength so that he can pull down the pillars that support the roof of this massive building, building and uh, hundreds if not thousands of people are killed uh, because of that, of the Philistines. Now this particular woodcut shows him with long hair again. I don't, I, the text doesn't say all of a sudden, you know, it's like one of those Barbie dolls where the hair can just come out <laughs> really quick. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> but uh, the Lord gives him strength. So, I mean, you've got some questionable characters. Uh, I mean, there's much more to this. Samson, with his she problem, was always visiting brothels and, and whorehouses and so forth. And yet, well, yeah, yeah, right. I mean, that's, that's uh, the point. But God uses him. Why God chooses to use him, I don't know. But that's the testimony that in spite of his sin, um, God uses it. Does Nazareth have anything to do with Nazarite? No, no, those are distinct and, and separate uh, roots to those. Okay, then towards the end of the book of Judges here, you've got um, uh, the tribe of Dan had been down in this territory and they essentially move. The whole tribe moves up here and takes this little territory up here, far to the north. And uh, what they also do is they take an altar that had been here and bring it up here as well. Not much is made of that here in Judges, but that will become significant later on in the period of the divided kingdom because one of the shrines and the places where uh, Jeroboam sets up an altar to a golden calf is up here in Dan. But uh, it's just showing now the movement. This whole tribe essentially moves up to the north. And hereafter then, Dan will be associated with the far north of Israelite territory. And then there's this sordid account towards the end of the uh, Levite's concubine. Okay, let me go back here. 
Um, it's a story of a Levite. Remember, Levites were spread throughout the territory, but this Levite actually lived in Ephraim, and he had a concubine, a woman, not his wife, but a maidservant with him. And uh, they had been visiting in Bethlehem, okay? And uh, they are going back, and they go through the territory of Benjamin here to get back to Ephraim, and something happens. Uh, the men of Benjamin demand that the Levite give them his concubine for the men to do with her as they please, to have their way with her. It's, it's almost kind of the same kind of language that you, you heard back in Genesis chapters, uh, what was it, 19, with Sodom. You know, where they, they, the visitor is here and, and uh, the men of the, the town say, you know, we want to um, molest uh, the visitor. And so uh, the woman is just ravaged uh, in this gang rape of her. And she's, she actually dies. I mean, she's not dead the next morning, but uh, she, she eventually dies. And what the Levite then does is chop her body up into pieces and sends pieces to all the other tribes of Israel. <laughs> and so when the leaders of the other tribes, you know, they open up the package and there's a foot, okay? Well, I mean, that would get your attention, what's going on here. And uh, the message then is, um, this is what the tribe of Benjamin has done. What are you going to do about it? Okay. Um, so actually, there's. Uh, I mean, he takes her away and uh, to Ephraim, and then cuts her up and sends the pieces around. So the uh, uh, the other tribes respond here. Okay. And um, 400,000 troops arrive from the other 11 tribes. Remember, the Levites themselves can't fight. And this is the point for, for this Levite. He can't summon his own tribe. They're not to take up arms. So he summons the other tribes. And they assemble against Benjamin. So it's 400,000 against 26,000 Benjaminites. And it's a holy war now because the tribe of Benjamin has become worse than the Canaanites. And the, the problem is, is the rest of the Benjaminites stand up for these men who have carried out this crime. So they are part of the problem here as well. And uh, uh, so this battle takes place. And uh, of the 11 tribes, other than Benjamin, 40,000 are killed, but of the tribe of Benjamin, 25,000 are killed. Remember, there are only 26,000 to start with. Actually, there are only 600 uh, men of the tribe of Benjamin that are left. And so you've got lots of women, so the other tribes then take the women, the, the women of Benjamin, and... Uh, you know, they become their wives and concubines and so forth. So it's really a, a sordid affair, but the message behind this now is that <laughs> Israel has become about as bad as the Canaanites. Um, they've gone from bad to worse, and, um, and the outcome of this is practically one tribe is gone. There's still a few Benjaminites here and there. In fact, King Saul was from the tribe of Benjamin. Um, most of the Benjaminites then are relocated up north um, in Jabesh Gilead. I don't know if I've got a, uh, that's up here um, in Naphtali, but um, Jabesh Gilead. No, I'm sorry, it's around here in, in Manasseh, I'm sorry. Um, but there's practically one whole tribe that's gone now. And uh, um, 
that's kind of the way things end. This just kind of shows then each of the uh, judges, the oppressors, the years of the oppression, from what tribe did they come, the years of their rule. For some of them, we don't really know. But um, you have to also remember that these years oftentimes overlapped. So you just can't add them up and come to the grand total at the end. So as we reflect then on the book of Judges here, that the continuing cycle of the apostasy, the battering, cry, and the deliverance. But Judges concludes then with this statement, in those days Israel had no king, everyone did as he saw fit in his own eyes. Um, it's anarchy essentially that you have at the end here. However, during this period, there is one delightful little story uh, that does not involve <laughs> all kinds of sordid corruption and conflict and bloodshed and so forth. And that's the story of Ruth. Okay? And there's some significant lessons to be learned from this story. Okay? It takes place, as I said before, during the period of the judges. And Ruth comes from Moab. Okay, so Moab, remember, is there in the southeast of the Sea of Galilee, not part of the promised land territory, um, but not friendly necessarily to the Israelites. Okay, the situation behind the story is that um, uh, there was a family from the tribe of Judah who originally lived in Bethlehem. Because of a famine, they sojourn in the land of Moab during this time. That is, they go and live because apparently there was food there. So they go and live there. And uh, the, the matriarch of that family's name is Naomi. Okay, Naomi. Her husband dies, and she has two sons. And those two sons marry Moabite woman, but the two sons die, leaving those two Moabitesses as widows. So you've got three widows here. Naomi, who's the mother-in-law, and two daughters-in-law. One of those daughters-in-law is Ruth. Now. A woman during this period without a husband is in trouble, in dire straits. And so um, you have to depend on other family members to support you, extended family. Well, Naomi doesn't have any extended family other than these two daughters-in-law. So she says, I'm going back to Judah. I'm going back to Bethlehem to uh, be supported by my extended family there. Uh, the two daughters initially say, we'll both go with you. This shows the love that they have. Uh, Naomi tries to dissuade them, say, no, this is your country. This is your people. Stay here. But Ruth is persistent. The other daughter-in-law, I don't remember her name, Orpah? Yeah, okay, Orpah. Uh, decides, decides to stay in Moab, but Ruth is tenacious and she says, I will go with you. I'll go with you. And um, uh, she says, uh, the famous line, I think, no, I guess I don't, didn't put it up here. Um, the, Wherever you go, I will go. Oh, yeah, okay. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Oftentimes used as a wedding text, you know. But it's between two women, okay? Um, not in a marriage context, obviously. But it is perhaps appropriate for a wedding text in the sense that it's a kind of covenant context. What Ruth is saying here is, I'm in covenant with you and shows covenant faithfulness, just like marriage is a covenant, to an Israelite. So she accompanies Naomi, her mother-in-law, back to Bethlehem. 
and there they live as two widows. And uh, the only way for them to survive is through the provision that the Mosaic law had for the poor, for the care of the poor, that uh, the farmers were to allow for certain sections of their fields not to be harvested uh, for the poor to come and take. And they could, the poor could also go into the fields and glean whatever was kind of left lying on the ground. And so Ruth becomes a gleaner. She's, that's how they survive, by going out and simply picking up what's left over of the grain. Okay. Um, Naomi apparently is not really able to do that. She must be too old to, to really do that kind of hard manual labor. Um, but they're back in Bethlehem, and they're back among Naomi's extended family. And in the law of Moses, there was what was what we now call the Leverite laws. Now, this has nothing to do, though, with the tribe of Levi or the Levitical law. It's just a coincidence. It comes from the Latin, and maybe a uh, Timaeus, you know what the Latin is. I think it's something like Lavera or something to be a brother-in-law. Um, what is it here? I don't even have those notes. But it comes from the Latin um, for brother-in-law. Okay, And uh, according to the Mosaic law, if your brother dies, you are responsible to marry his widow, to care for her. Okay, So you remember uh, the question that the Sadducees brought to Jesus. He said there was this woman, she um, uh, was married to one guy, he died, married his brother, he died, another brother, seven brothers, they all died. Who's she going to be married to in the resurrection. And without getting into Jesus' response, that's illustrating here that Leverite uh, law. Well, um, the brother-in-laws are expected to do this, but if, the, if there's no brother-in-law, the expectation goes to the nearest male relative. Keeps going on. Um, there's a man there in Bethlehem by the name of Boaz, who sees this woman, Ruth, gleaning, and wonders who she is. And he treats her kindly. And Ruth goes back to Naomi and says, you know, there's this guy, Boaz, who just treats me very, very well. He's a very gracious, kind man. And Naomi's eyes light up. Boaz is one of our relatives. So there's that relative connection there, kinsman connection. And so eventually Boaz is made aware of this relationship as well. And he sees the virtues of Ruth, um, someone who had been married to one of his relatives. Uh, however, there is another man who is closer in terms of the kinship relationship than Boaz. So that has to be dealt with. Uh, Ruth also takes some initiative. Uh, to us, it may sound a little bit forward, but it was, according to my understanding here, a very appropriate and, and uh, humble thing to do, that while Boaz was sleeping in the barn, she comes and kind of curls up next to his feet. And uh, it's, it was a very appropriate gesture of saying, uh, I am willing to be um, considered by you uh, as a wife. And so he was glad to have kind of that green light. And so he pursues the possibility of marrying Ruth. Um, he first of all goes to this other relative who has, in a sense, first dibs on her. And um, uh, he declines, so now Boaz marries Ruth. And uh, they, 
Uh, this shows her gleaning and Boaz there uh, sees her. Um, they produce a son named Obed. Obed then produces a son named Jesse and Jesse produces David. Okay, So Ruth is the great grandmother of King David. And as you look in the genealogies of Jesus as well, you will see that she, Ruth, is identified as um, ancestress of Jesus, too. So, what's the point of this story? Why is it there? What do you think? Probably for the same reason it was in Matthew's genealogy. It was a Moabite woman, um, and through her, just the same thing as we had a line of Christ descended. Okay, okay. So it is showing here that God is carrying out his purposes uh, through the chosen people, the descendants of Abraham, through Isaac and Jacob, but uh, Moab is not, remember Moab, Moabites are descendants of Lot, uh, not of Abraham, and yet she is included now. So outsiders are welcome to be a part of the co covenant community uh, if they will accept the covenant <laughs> and follow Yahweh as the true God, as she said she would. Your God will be my God. So she is included. And I think it's very significant that this falls during the period of the judges because it does show that the, the intention here was not purely national or racial in terms of the extermination of the Canaanites. But for Canaanites like Rahab, Moabites like Ruth, who will follow the true God, there is grace, there is mercy, there is full incorporation into the covenant community. I think that's the, the main point of the, the story. <coughs> 